what is the what is the very short let's start with a very short like two sentence layman's description of thin places and then we'll dive in a little deeper but just at a very high level what are thin places uh first of all they're places so they're settings or locations and and they can either be urban or they can be rural or they can be natural uh they're places that um, somehow um, have a veil that separates, let's say, secular, profane places and spaces from charged or sacred places. So there are sacred places or charged places in cities and, you know, like a church um, or in nature, like a holy well, that... Um, have this kind of charge to it. And what a thin place is, it becomes a thin place when you are able to move from your normal consciousness and normal state of being into the energy of that place. And you get and you begin to transform yourself. So there's a transformative quality to thin places. And the veil is thick or thin. So if you're having trouble having getting access to it, then the veil is thick. And taking it at a city planning level where you have blocks and blocks of ugly streets and buildings, then that's going to be considered very thick. Following is my conversation with Dr. Philip Tabb, Professor Emeritus of Architecture at Texas A&M University. Phil is the master planner of Serenby, a beautiful community in Georgia, and the author of six books, including Serene Urbanism and the soon-to-be-published Thin Places. Phil's voice on inspired and biophilic and sustainable neighborhoods, towns, and cities is unparalleled. I've been fortunate enough to work with Phil to get to know him, to learn from him, and I'm so happy to be able to sit down with him today on this podcast so that you can get to know him as well. This is the Kathleen Sessions podcast. The most meaningful way to support this work is to subscribe to our channel on YouTube, on Apple Podcasts, and to visit the website at thekathleensessions.com. Enjoy my conversation with Dr. Philip Tab. Can you provide an overview of the concept of placemaking or your concept of placemaking? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think I first became interested in the, the notion of place. And of course, placemaking comes after that. But um, after my uh, 10 years of studying uh, sustainability and then uh, going off to England and working on a doctorate on village planning, and it was in the process of uh, beginning to understand both the anatomy and the sustainable constituents of a village that began to uh, get me very interested in the notion of place and that sustainability can't really exist without being in place or in a place. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, then I started uh, doing some research into people that were doing research into, into place. Came across a guy by the name of Edward Casey out of Stony Brook, State University of New York in Stony Brook. And he's written a number of books. Uh, and his, I think, major book was called The Fate of Place. And it's basically a phenomenological history of place. And I got very interested in that because he started off with the first place, which was very interesting. And the, the first chapter or so was all about creation myths. And it was very interesting to see how various cultures have try to explain how the world came into being. And uh, what he says is basically, it had to start with place. There had to be a place. And uh, even looking at the uh, Genesis, uh, you begin to see uh, the components of what makes up a place. And then I uh, came in contact with an architect that was teaching at the State University of New York in Buffalo by the name of Michael Brill. And he and his students had won a National Endowment of the Arts grant to study sacred places. And later they began to call them charged places rather than sacred because it has too much of a religious connotation. Mm -hmm. So the idea was 
that they were places, but they had a charge to them. And um, that really uh, got me interested. Uh, when I was at working with the villages, I was wondering, well, what makes a village vital? Because there's in, in England, there's 10,000 villages. So some are more vital than others. So there's certain patterns uh, that make up a village, but then there's certain things that are beginning to operate that make them more vital. So I was very interested in that. And so Michael Brill's work began to answer some of the questions that I had. <clears throat> and then I discovered that uh, he developed a series of patterns that were present in these charged places. And I found out that they were really similar to the patterns that I was finding that made up a vital English village. So we began to correspond, and uh, then I began to kind of meld the patterns that I was evolving and his patterns and came up with a series of placemaking patterns. Then in the early 90s, uh, through the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture, uh, uh, my best friend and I were invited to go to Rome, it was my first time in Rome, and uh, present these concepts about sacred place. For them, it was sacred place. So um, I showed them these patterns and got a really wonderful response to the patterns. Mm -hmm. So uh, from that point on, I began to always think about the patterns when I design anything, whether it's a, a house or a later on in 2000, uh, Serenity community. And to give you an idea, some of the patterns are like acknowledging a center. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a highly articulated center. Like, let's say there's a plaza, let's say uh, Piazza San Marco. Uh, in that piazza, there isn't a highly articulated center, but there is a kind of an imagined center in that space. But in other cases, you'll find out there's a fountain or there's something that's really uh, articulating that particular center. Uh, bounding is another one of the characteristics that are really important. And with uh, Michael Brill, not only was it bounding, but he called what he called differentiated bounding, meaning that the north boundary was different than the south boundary and so on. And so that was really interesting because he didn't want to see the boundary just as the same thing repeated around, mm -hmm. like all the points on a circle, but rather right. having personality and meaning mm -hmm. uh, that would or, or or the potential for giving meaning to the people who are experiencing that place. Another one of the important patterns was passage. And this is one of my favorite patterns, actually, because it's the transition between secular space and sacred space. And for him, it was, uh, it was a space. It was a place, a place of pause. So you go from your secular environment and secular consciousness into this neutral place, like a vestibule in, in a building. And then you can spend as much time or as little time there to kind of center yourself. And then you're ready to move into the sacred space and become more, let's say, open and more susceptible to a kind of a transcendent experience. So passage is really, impo really important. And I, I had visited Cologne Cathedral, and um, I noticed that when I uh, approached the cathedral from about two blocks away, uh, you could see these giant art, you know, Gothic arches. And uh, the, the, I think it was the west facade was uh, it's very flat. The arches are very two-dimensional almost, right? But then as you get up closer to it, you find out that they're actually corbelled, meaning that they're three-dimensional arches. And then when you get right up, to, about to, ready to enter the building, you notice you're actually in a space that's defined by these arches. And so for me, that was one of these passage spaces. And then, of course, when you get to the door to the cathedral, they're massive, heavy doors. So it really takes an effort to kind of open the door and then move into the sacred space. So this whole notion of passage is really important. Another one was uh, reaching upward. So uh, Keith Critchlow, one of my teachers, used to call it levity, the levity of a sacred space that begins to kind of raise your, your sense or your consciousness up. Another one is the opposite of that, which is grounding. And very often when we center ourselves, we concentrate on our feet and, and how the feet meet the ground. So it's a grounding process. So in a way, uh, an urban space or a building has the same kind of qualities that can ground itself in that site. Um, nature within is another one. And of course, nature within is a biophilic consideration. 
And um, so more vital sacred place, places seem to have different kinds of elements of, of nature in it, whether it's the elemental qualities like water, fire, earth, and air, candles in a church, um, uh, uh, water fountains and, and the like. And the materiality, uh, according to Michael, he felt that these sacred spaces or charged spaces needed to be built out of difficult to work materials not mm. common material. Now, I didn't necessarily agree with him because I was in part trying to promote the idea of sacred places in in everyday places, you know, how you can find the sacred in everyday experiences. So uh, in that sense, having difficult to work materials and expensive materials doesn't fit. So anyway, that was one area where we uh, didn't necessarily agree. Anyway, the, he developed about 14 patterns. And over the years, I've kind of worked with 20 patterns um, similar to these. And so anyway, that's uh, that's my sense of placemaking. So when you first went to Europe or went to England and were studying these villages and then kind of uncovering the things that make places feel charged or wonderful or whatever it is, how did that compare? Did you feel, how did that compare to the way that the United States was, had been developed and was continuously developing in terms of urban planning and placemaking and stuff? I mean, you know, can you talk about the distinction between the two? Well, my background started, I mean, I was educated as an architect in the 60s. And then in the 70s, um, after the oil embargo, I got heavily involved in solar energy. So for that decade, from about 73 to 83, I was very much into alternative technology and sustainability and its relationship to architecture. But I was also beginning to apply those concepts to planning. And my master's degree was in the area of solar villages or solar communities. So I was beginning to, uh, I had discovered that individual buildings can be quite sustainable, but what happens when you start looking at larger numbers of buildings? And so that led me to that. And then I felt like English villages were a good model because they were more integrated and they were beyond technology. It wasn't just technological mm -hmm. interventions that was making them. And so uh, the quest was, well, what was it? you know, that was making English villages uh, sustainable, in a sense. And, uh, and I'm, assuming that, the, go ahead. I'm assuming at this point, sustainability, you're starting to look at that, not just in terms of energy, but uh, meaning, meaning uh, energy use, like, uh, you know, electricity and, and gas and, you know, all of that. But I'm, I, I sense that you're starting to look at sustainability in terms of people, and what's this, you know, um, can you comment on that at all? I mean. Yeah. Uh, well, I went from like the single technology of solar energy. And then in the late 70s and into the early 80s, it was renewable resources. So it was, you know, water, air, uh, energy and all of that. So kind of all packaged in a sense. So how could we have uh, renewable basic resources? But uh the question of going beyond the technology of it uh, wasn't something that I was initially intending to, to learn from English villages, but it was a consequence of me moving to England and experiencing a lot of villages and reading a lot about villages to discover that um, there was something else that I could begin to explore that was beyond the technology. And uh, part of that was land use, many of the things that we did with Bell Farm, land use strategies, of uh, looking at density and mixes of use and that sort of stuff. But um, I think the, the question of the quality of community or sense of community began to evolve. And one of the definitions of uh, an English village in England is if it feels like a village, it's a village. <laughs> There are a lot of people who are trying to objectively define what a village is. How big is it? What's the population? Does it have a, a market? Is there any kind of, what's the nature of the governance of the place as uh, defining what a village is? And uh, they did come up with some criteria, 
But I really love the one about, you know, does it feel like a village? Which in a way, does it feel like a place? And part of that is the degree to which, well, in two things. One is most English villages were sustainable. I mean, the average uh, English village 500 to 1,000 to 1,500 years ago was self-sustaining. And not only that, they were located about two to five or 10 miles apart from one another. And it was very rare that anybody in one village knew any, anything about the other village. It was the minstrels that went around from village to village that were the newspapers uh, that uh, distributed the news of one place to another. So there is that quality. And then uh, there was this notion that if they're self-contained and self-sufficient, then they're supplying themselves with all of what they need from agriculture to, of course, in English villages, and it's similar to in other places in the world, but the pharmacy, the dressmaker, the candlestick maker, the butcher, the, 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 uh, the grocery store and so on, um, and pubs had all the, in, in the in medical facilities and schools, they had all these land use components that were contributing to creating a sense of community. And in comparing that to America, uh, what we were doing is moving away from that. We were going to single-use zoning. You know, suburbs are a good example of single-use zoning. Basically, you get a, a large tract of land and you just put all single-family houses there. So you don't have this mix of uh, land uses and, and buildings that begin to support and create community. The way we did it in America was supply to everybody with an automobile. So the automobile is the way that gets you to the grocery store, gets you to a church, or it gets you to um, a pharmacy, it gets you to schools, and so on. So that was the way that we did, and we did that for 50 years. We're still doing it today, but uh, a little bit less so. So um, the another thing was the, I guess, the transition of populations in America moving from city centers out to suburbs and even from suburbs out further to extra urban, uh, ex urban areas. So there's this kind of escape the city. And with the advent of some, uh, public transportation and really nice cars, making the commute, um, was somewhat enjoyable. So, uh, again, my objective with the English villages was, uh, how can we, how could I bring the knowledge that I learned from England back to America and begin to create uh, or uh, influence um, developments that have this richer sense of what I call critical land uses? Those land uses that can begin to reduce your need for the automobile and actually begin to put you out of the car and as a, a pedestrian, creating walkable communities. And the places that I lived in England and uh, in Italy later on were walkable. When I worked and taught in England or in Italy for four months, I didn't have a car. And maybe one time out of three or four months, I would be in a car. All the other times was walking and taking the train. And it was really a whole other way of kind of being in community and also having my needs met, which was, I think, the major lesson is to have your critical needs met without being dependent, uh, having to depend on the automobile. So anyway, well, and, and this, this, um, you know, this sense of um, placelessness that we feel driving across the country here. I mean, not that every place is like that there. We have some exceptions to that rule, but it, um, there is that feeling of, of bland, placelessness that I think so much of what your life's work, you know, um, has been about and studying and studying the contrast and the differences um, helps us see what the, what the, what are the things we can specifically do to invite more of a sense of place into this beautiful country and, um, you know, and, and, you know, live inspired lives as a result, you know, um, instead of this just vague feeling of not having uh, a vague feeling of really no sense of home. So again, I, I commend you, your body of work, your books, everything is just like 
your line of thinking throughout the years, what led you from one thing to the next? It's just, it, it is, you, you are a gift and I'm, I'm really, really, really grateful. So, okay, let's move on. Um, what role in all of this does serenity play? And I guess that's a little bit tied to what I was just saying, right? Like what, um, what we might not be feeling here in terms of certain areas of the country, what role in placemaking does serenity play? Well, I think we've, uh, as a culture, um, we've always valued serenity. So uh, what do you do when you go on vacation? I mean, for the most part, we go to a place that's different than your bland suburb or inner city place. And you go to some place where you can relax. You go to the beach. Uh, you go to a national park. Uh, some people go on cruises. It, uh, it's uh, a way to get away and to experience the sense of serenity. And uh, what I've done is combined the qualities of serenity and our need to have serene moments in our lives with the opposite in a way which is urban. So especially when you come to uh, planning, it's like how can you create places that have a, an urban quality that uh, in a way um, invites us to engage with one another and to engage with the place and at the same time has the possibility of serene moments. So I know in my own life and in my own house, I have both. You know, there are times when I'm a so, very social being, and I really like that, and when I connect to the community, and then there are times when I need to be alone. And so I need both of those qualities in my life, and in fact, on a daily basis. So uh, a lot of my work from the, I guess, late 90s and into uh, this particular sen uh, century has been about combining both serenity and urbanism uh, together. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about serenity when we get to thin places. And, and before we get to thin places, um, t can you, and, and I'm sure you'll touch on it a little bit there, but how does the streetscape, <laughs> how does streetscape play into what you're, you're talking about? And again, how will, how does that um, play, how, how did that play out differently here in the United States? Well, the streets uh, generally here in the United States are not very friendly, especially in the suburbs. I mean, they don't, many of them don't even have sidewalks and the houses are set far back. So there is no friendly interaction. If there was someone who happened to be walking on the street, which is very rare. So what we do here in America is drive by in our cars and you may know somebody and wave to them, but that's about it. And of course, in urban areas, it's it's different. But um, in the sub suburban areas, that's kind of the major the major thing. And the streetscape, also in America, especially in the suburbs, is dominated by the garage. You know, one, two, three, four car garages dominating the street facade, and then a small entrance, <laughs> uh, sort of hidden behind the garage. So and we have the driveway. In fact, the way that most people kind of interact is when you're out there fixing your car or washing your car. And your next door neighbor had to be happened to be doing the same thing. So uh, the automobile was the main catalyst for creating kind of a sense of community. Uh, the schools were too, but you had to drive or be bused to the schools to get there. Um, so the streetscape, to me, I mean, I'm not a, a streetscape person other than the, the fact that really well-designed streets become a place. So it's not a street for cars to go back and forth, but it becomes a place where people can engage and, and interact. And in that sense, uh, it's much better. You know, like a shopping street that's uh, that's fairly pedestrian oriented, um, has a lot of diversity and quality and complexity uh, and uh, is very uh, attractive uh, to experience. Right. right. I, and I think that's one thing that I, again, as, as so many new big buildings go up and so many of them look the same and they are defining our streets and there's not that difference in materiality. There's not a human scale in terms of where the building meets the street. We lose something in the process. So although that building might have been less expensive to build, um, it, it takes away something from the public realm. 
Um, and so just that thinking, just if we could, you know, be mo- more mindful in general of, of the streets as a, as a sense, as a, as a sense of place, you know, um, yes. in terms of walkability, but also in terms of delighting people, like what's a, you know, um, inspiring people and not just what's the cheapest to slap up and then we're going to tear it down in 15 years because it's now blight and, you know, was made with not great materials. And so now we want to replace it. I just think kind of getting back to a sense of quality and how things interplay with the whole, right? Um, so anyway, I don't know. I just feel so strongly, like when I was at Serenby, just the, the way that the streets were designed and the streetscape was so different than most places in this country. I mean, although, you know, they kind of harken back a little bit to the old Main Street. A li- you know, there's a little bit of, of sense of that. But there was so much someone actually paid attention. You paid attention. Steve paid attention. Someone actually paid attention and was thoughtful about the way the streets were going to play out so that they could invite a sense of place. And it's, it, you feel that in your bones the moment you arrive at Serenby and it, it makes you think, why isn't more of the country like this? Because this is inspiring. This brings me serenity, but also brings a smile to my face, makes me laugh out loud when I'm interacting with the people I'm meeting on the street. Or like you said, there's quiet ways to interact with all that as well in terms of popping off on one of the nature trails, you know, so that that intersects with the street. So I, I just... I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I just think, you know, uh, um, it is such an important part of this whole sense of, of placemaking. And I wish more developers and more cities and more land planners, um, you know, were, were really wired in this direction. So well, I think I'm just, hit, I'll leave that at that. I think you hit the nail on the head in, in the sense that, What's the, a holistic approach to planning? And um, especially with uh, my experiences at Serenby, I have learned that it's a systemic issue. In other words, you can't just attack street facades because street facades alone aren't going to do it. I mean, you have, right. to, you have to really take a look at all of the different layers from land use to density gradients to the uh, percentage of open space to uh, encourage scale and encouraging uh, pedestrian moments and circulation. All of these things need to uh, be a part of the equation. And there, and once you begin to work with um, all of those, um, then you begin, I think, to open up the possibility of having greater senses of place. Okay, let's, um, let's, let's shift and talk about a little bit about biophilia before we move on to thin places. So what is biophilia? Well, biophilia is relatively new. Uh, I think it was first coined by Eric Fromm, and he really saw it as the relationship between humans and nature, but a, a kind of the love that we have for nature. And so it's this emotional response that we have to nature. And later, um, um, Wilson and Kellert and others began to define biophilia as our affinity towards nature and living and living processes. So we naturally have an innate feeling towards nature and love of nature. And that's probably pretty true. So, um, but in a way, that's somewhat simplistic because it's not going to guide planning processes <laughs> or, or buildings that are biophilic. Uh, but as a result of some of the early research, um, again, patterns that begin to contribute to this, let's call it a biophilic experience, um, because in a way it is an emotional response to, to place, that um, began to give designers some ideas about how to design uh, biophilic environments. And I think Killert uh, came up with something like 72 different patterns, many of which were very close to one another. Later, he brought that down to about 25. 
and Terrapin Bright Green with uh, uh, Bill Browning and his folks there uh, narrowed it down to 14 patterns. And those 14 patterns were widely um, distributed on the internet. And then lately they've added a 15th pattern called Awe. So there's like these patterns mm -hmm. very similar to the placemaking patterns that I had learned in the 80s uh, with Michael Brill. Um, you have these patterns that uh, begin to inform, uh, let's say, biophilic uh, designs. And uh, But I, I think the primary aspect of these patterns is that they are mostly all tied back to nature in some form or another, uh, such as light in all the different kinds of qualities of light from diffuse to direct to, um, to uh, light and shadow uh, to the elemental qualities of moving water, the, the sensory connections we have uh, with all of our senses with the environment, uh, views to the environment. Another one of their patterns is um, prospect and, and uh, refuge. In other words, being able to see any possible harm that might be coming your way, and at the same time having an environment that begins to protect. And of course, these refuge spaces really came to uh, be important during the pandemic that we just had, where we had to have sanctuary spaces for people. So um, uh, designs that uh, reflect nature and, and natural systems are a part of the biophilic, uh, I guess, uh, design palette. And anyway, there's like lots of different design patterns. And um, only recently, I think, um, at least in, in the group that I'm connected with at the, uh, the Biophilic uh, Leadership Institute, includes uh, Tim Bately and, and uh, Bill Browning and others. Uh, we're really looking at the notion of an integrated scalar response to biophilia. Because we know that, you know, you can stick trees on a building and call it biophilia. And you can... Uh, begin to reduce indoor air pollution and call it biophilic. But the real challenge is how do you make biophilic landscapes, biophilic buildings, biophilic interiors, biophilic neighborhoods, biophilic cities? How do, how do the same principles begin to operate on all these different scales? Because mm -hmm. once they're operating at those scales, you're going to get synergy between the scales, and you're going to get a true biophilic environment. Uh, sticking a biophilic building, um, you know, in a polluted city is going to help, but it's not going to transform the city. Right. And it's, I think that's still... just it, because we, we all can think of places, sometimes very urban places, but sometimes they can be suburban, too, where there is just no sense of connection with nature and how jarring that is and how agitating that edge is in terms of when you're in a concrete jungle or you're, you know, and there's just not access to these elements of nature, which are so calming and peaceful and bring so much joy and can, to your point, interplay with urban environments if done right and on the multiple layers you're talking about. So I'm just going to ask you a couple questions related to this. So on a land planning basis, like if you're looking at a, a village or a city, a United States village or city, you know, what are a few specific things when you're first just looking at land planning and city urban planning, what are a couple things that come to mind in terms of what city planners can be thinking about? Well, from a biophilic point of view, the two, for me, the two most obvious are streetscapes um, like the High Line in New York City. Mm, um, yes. In a sense. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, park, and parks like Central Park. Right. Okay. So Park. can you, yeah, go ahead. Can you explain what the High Line is just for people listening who don't, who aren't aware? Yeah. Well, it was a, uh, a railroad uh, line that was abandoned on a second story above the street level that uh, went down sort of the west side of, um, of Manhattan. And I think it was 1.6 miles long. And uh, through the efforts of some landscape architects and others, they transformed it. They took the tracks off. They transformed it into a pedestrian, basically a pedestrian mall, uh, in a sense, with uh, a landscape that was just quite beautiful. And one of the remarkable uh, consequences of this was that the buildings, second-story buildings that faced onto the, uh, the High Line began to increase in value 
obviously, because mm. now you have views of this beautiful landscape below. And I think some non-residential land uses began to kind of uh, 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 percolate along there as well. So um, anyway, it's really highly visited as you know, one of the attractions when you go to New York City. I, so and I'm going to just pause here to send a shout out to land, landscape architects who, you know, um, do this really interesting and sometimes very challenging work throughout the country. And um, I think sometimes there's not a big awareness of the profession behind the scenes or what people do, but like super important to the fabric of our country. So parks, you know, like Savannah was built on a, uh, a grid of parks. And so uh, how, and also they had mixes of use. They had residential and commercial and, and uh, institutional buildings um, on these parks. And it was a very interesting way of developing a city. And I've taken a couple of classes there and uh, experienced these parks. And another thing that's really nice is each of the parks is a little bit different. So they're not the same park replicated. And I think that's a really interesting quality because then it it encourages you to, well, let's go to that park next time or, or this one uh, next week or whatever. So you have all these different choices uh, that you can go to. So anyway, the idea of parks and green spaces, uh, the way you deal with water and uh, storm water, these are other biophilic opportunities. Like at Serenpe, we have uh, most of our storm water is daylit. And so we have sort of natural um, troughs through which the, the storm water moves rather than totally going underground. And so you don't get to experience that, which would be to experience it and to see the water flowing down and hearing it as you're walking by would be a biophilic experience. So uh, these are just some of the ways uh, that you can do it. Um, I think uh, on larger cities and well, cities and towns, looking at infrastructure would be for me the first thing to do if you're trying to make a biophilic city or town is what's the infrastructure and how can you transform that into some sort of a renewable system or a system that has biophilic components to it that are visible and experiential. Um, Singapore, for example, uh, used to be called, I think it was a, uh, a city with parks and now it's a city in the park. So they've integrated the whole park system that they have there as one. The city and the park are all kind of one. So if cities can begin to envision themselves in this way, rather than mm -hmm. purely as an economic center or, or a uh, government center, but to think of it as a biophilic center, then you're going to begin, I think, to get some of these changes. And to really realize that so many of these things, whether it's at the land use level or the, um, you know, the, the building level or the home level that so many of these things like to not see them as optional as things to when you're designing or building them as things that uh, you can line item cross out if you're over budget. Because like, again, in terms of we've got a world that is highly anxious, you know, there's a lot of division, a lot of anger and literally the way that we choose to design um, our cities, our suburbs, our buildings, our homes can like help, um, take the edge off of all of that so we can like live in more unity. So it, it, I think so many times things just get line itemed, scratched off, you know, at the, when these things are being budgeted and designed and, and they just shouldn't be seen as optional. Just like you wouldn't cross off the need for an HVAC system, you shouldn't cross off, you know, <clears throat> the need for um, it, to the ability to commune with nature. Absolutely. Uh, one of my promoting uh, efforts here at Serenby is to get more people to um, uh, use uh, photovoltaic systems for electricity production. It's not required although we, we're getting more and more people um, beginning to do it. But uh, it's like I say, we have a lot of cars here that are Teslas and Mercedes and Audis and BMWs and a lot of cars that are more than $100,000. And um, my point is, if you bought a complete PV system and Tesla battery and all of that, 
at about forty thousand dollars, and you bought a Subaru, you'd be you'd come out spending less money than buying that expensive uh, Audi. So it's a matter of choices and priorities. All right. So people still here would rather drive around in a hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollar Tesla X um, performance uh, rather than go PV. And they right. think they're 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 being sustainable because they have an electric car. But anyway, <laughs> and that's not okay. what we hear. Right, right. Um, so <clears throat> let's move on to something that is very near and dear to your heart and ties into all of this. And this is wonderful work that you're doing on this concept of thin places. So what is the, what is the very short, let's start with a very short, like two sentence layman's description of thin places. And then we'll dive in a little deeper, but just at a very high level, what are thin places? Uh, first of all, they're places. So they're settings or locations. And, and they can either be urban or they can be rural or they can be natural. Uh, they're places that um, somehow um, have a veil that separates, let's say, secular, profane places and spaces from charged or sacred places. So there are sacred places or charged places in cities and, you know, like a church um, or in nature, like a holy well, that um, have this kind of charge to it. And what a thin place is, it becomes a thin place when you are able to move from your normal consciousness and normal state of being into the energy of that place. And you get and you begin to transform yourself. So there's a transformative quality to thin places. And the veil is thick or thin. So if you're having trouble having getting access to it, then the veil is thick. And taking it at a city planning level where you have blocks and blocks of ugly streets and buildings, then that's going to be considered very thick. So um, if you had tree-lined streets, then the veil is going to be very thin. And it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're walking down a tree-lined street that you're in a thin place. But a thin place experience can happen if certain things happen as you're going along that walk. And you begin to understand the, di the difference between the sort of secular space that you're in and the secular consciousness that you have and moving into another realm. Is so, it fair uh, to say, is it fair to say that thin places are those places that we often can't explain, but they invoke a sense of like awe. Yes, uh, you can say that. Um, one of the, especially the, let's say the spiritual side, if I can use that word of the experience is something very often it's hard to explain, but it's something that you feel. So, and if you feel it means that there's an emotional response. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically thin places elicit a variety of emotional responses. And uh, a lot of the research that's been done on thin places over the last almost 20 years has been done in the area of the emotional responses to either awe or serenity, which are the two main emotions that you get from a thin place. And they're almost opposite one another because one is very exciting and stimulating, the other is very calming and peaceful. So in a depend and the thin places really vary like I was mentioning before, going to a cathedral, very often you're going to have this all experience, yet going to a very small, intimate healing well um, and just a trickle of water um, is going to give you this serene experience. So anyway, uh, they elicit those two different kinds of emotions. And why is it let... important? Why is it important that we study these or that we're aware of this concept? I don't know if it's important. Uh, I just think that we, you know, it's like biophilia, the innate um, 
love of nature. I think we as human beings have an innate love of these transformative experiences. And when you go on a vacation, sometimes you might call it fun, right? <laughs> uh, we're going to go have some fun. Uh, but in a way, that fun is a transformative experience. So we're looking for these transformative experiences. Mm-hmm. Now, in the um, awe and both serenity emotion research, they define it as something in, in awe research. It, uh, awe experiences are vast. So you experience something that's vast or large. And there's a need for um, what's called accommodation, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, the vastness can be in the form of somebody who's really important. You could meet the Dalai Lama and have an awe experience. Or you can have an awe experience from being exposed to a concept that's just like super extraordinary. And, and of course, the ones that I'm in, interested in are the ones that are connected to place. So all experiences because a place is beautiful or because it is just incredible, you know, like a place where you can see shooting stars or you, you can have a view of a sunset, you know, like a beach is, is a thin place during these moments. Uh, so these are some of the qualities of awe. And then the serenity is kind of the opposite because you're able to kind of go in and quiet everything inside of you, where uh, the awe experience is really trying to stimulate you and get you connected you know, to everything on the outside. The serenity experience is trying to connect you on the inside. So uh, I, f- I found that really kind of interesting that the architecture planning can begin to uh, contribute to the possibility of these emotional responses. And to remember that um, we have to be, um, uh, there's got to, without intention of wanting places like that, without intention, we end up just getting whatever um, commercialism or um, will serve up, right? Whatever, whatever capitalism will serve up, whatever is the most cost-effective building or space to throw on a site, it's. I think this is a reminder that we have to be intentional about understanding the importance of these places, and then the understanding which you're trying to bring forth um, of of the whys and the hows to create them. Yeah, the uh, remembering is is really important. The um, De- uh, Deckard Keltner defines uh, all experiences as something that's perceived to be vast and has the need for accommodation. And this accommodation, I think, is a really interesting concept because it assumes that you've had a transformative experience. You've gone from A to B, and having gone to B it begins to change the mental structures in the case of all experiences and the emotional structures in cases of serene experiences. So it begins to shift those and change them. And then when you come back into the secular spaces from which you started, you need time to sort of integrate and factor and process this new information. And uh, a guy by the name of John Steele, um, was studying sacred places in England in the mid 80s and came up with the concept of uh, psychic amphibians. And when you have these transformative experiences, what he is saying that you need to be a psychic amphibian, meaning that you, when you go back to another state, like going from water back to air breathing, you remember what, what it was like to be in the water. And Or it's like a dream. Many people can remember their dreams, but many people can't remember their dreams. And if your dreams are important, then it might be good to to find a way to begin to remember those. So I think uh, the experience of a thin place is like that, where it can be very um, healing for you to begin to understand what it was that was going on when you're having this experience and and what you can do um, after you've had the experience. What's interesting as you're talking about this is that although on the one hand it evo- these places evoke these emotions that can range, you know, from awe to serenity and can be healing, I also think they could 
and I, I don't know that there's research on this. I'm just, I'm just speculating and maybe people have already talked about this or looked at this, but it also seems like they can really begin to shift. If they're shifting your mindset, could they be also cracking open our critical thinking and our creativity so that the more that we experience moments like these in places like these, when we go back to our everyday work or the secular, our secular lives, we can see things from a new perspective and, you know, um, be more creative with our solutions and um, just cracks everything open, not just the healing component, which alone, if that was all it did, it'd be one thing. But I guess I'm speaking from personal experience that the times I've inter interacted with places like this, I feel open in so many different ways. Um, so I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that. And again, I don't know if there's research on that or, or not, but. Well, yeah, one of the things that I'm uh, exploring in the book is the idea of everyday thin places. I mean, it's real easy to identify uh, extraordinary thin places. For me, like going to the 9-11 uh, memorial pools and wow, looking yes. in, in, into those pools um, was a serene, really a serene moment for me. And it really, and then you start thinking about the 9-11 tragedy and so on. And it really begins to affect you. And uh, also seeing the Oculus, which is right next door, uh, going into the interior of the Oculus uh, and seeing this incredible white space and, and uh, the, the generosity of this space uh, as an awe experience was just terrific. But how can my question was, how can you begin to do this on an everyday basis? And I was discovering that we do do that. We do do this on an everyday basis. Um, in and so we did it especially during um, the pandemic where we had to have sanctuary spaces and you had to have these places where you could begin to heal. But I began to look at things uh, like, is there a chair in your house that is your thin place? Mm. It's a place where you can begin to withdraw from the, the, the profanity of everyday life and find a place that uh, is renewing for you and, and healthy mm -hmm. for you. And, my, and, and I have a chair like that in, in my house, so I know. I have a garden, it's a walled-in garden, so that is another one of my thin places. And once I start kind of working in the garden, and after a while, you just kind of move into another space. And um, uh, about three months ago, I was invited to my uh, grandson's third birthday, and so I uh, flew out to Colorado. And uh, there were a lot of people around, and they brought in the birthday cake. And it had three candles on it because he was three. I noticed the lights went down and I noticed that the crowd kind of went around and the focus was on this cake. And I could see my grandson staring in, being mesmerized by the candles of this cake. And what is it you're asked to do when you have a birthday cake? Make a wish, right? Right. So... How do you, where where do you get the stuff to make that wish? You, you have to go in and go to some place, right? And then there you are, your whole world of these candles right in front of you. And then you take a deep breath and then you blow, okay? So to me, that was an incredible thin place experience. It was for me watching it, and I'm sure it was for my grandson. So there are these opportunities in everyday life uh, where thin place experiences do occur, and you can begin to, I think, recognize that you're having these kinds of experiences. And in some ways, you can plan for them. If you don't have a refuge space in your house or in a room, well, then make one. Um, mm -hmm. It's not hard to do that. Uh, you know, with one or two pieces of furniture, you can do yeah. it. So anyway... Uh, can you um outside of the outside of the New York City places you mentioned? Can you give other examples worldwide that are um, some of your favorite examples of thin places? And I understand that by doing this, we're not talking necessarily about the everyday, creating the everyday, which I love. I love that idea because it's something we can control right now. But what what are some other examples? Your favorite examples from around the world of a, of, of a few places. 
Well, I think the Grand Canyon, when you're sort of near the the ledge or the edge of the Grand Canyon, you're definitely experiencing experiencing vastness and the quality of that space. And it's a mile deep, and the colors, and uh, just the whole sense of the spatiality of it um, is really quite transforming. I think. Um, and for that matter, most national parks have that quality. I've been to a lot of national mm -hmm. parks. Or going to Niagara Falls and just standing near the edge and then just listening to the roar of that water going over and feeling the mist hitting your face um, sends, sends you into kind of another realm. So like I said, the national parks. When I was a kid, I was a f fisherman. I grew up in Idaho. And uh, I would walk down in my waders a river called the Buffalo River. That was on the Idaho side of the Tetons. And um, I would do it alone sometimes. And I'm in the middle of the river casting out. And it's so quiet. And the river was so clear that it almost magnified the rocks in the bottom of the river. It was just incredible. And then as you walk down, you could hear the sound of the river change because of the way it interacted with the, the sides of the river, uh, whether there was a log in the river, whether there was a rock there, all these things began to change the sound of the water slightly. And it was amazing to be that in tune with the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of the first experiences I realized how you could really connect to nature in such a, a profound way. Um, Man, uh, human-made places, I've been to Glastonbury well many times, and but uh, cathedrals, uh, not because they're religious practices there, but because of the quality of the space for me. Very uh, sharp cathedral, for example, Cologne Cathedral. Um, and even very small uh, village parish churches do it to me, especially the, those found in, in England and Italy and France. Um, they're, they're intimate, thick walls, usually whitewashed, and some stained glass, but there's just the quality and the woodwork of the trusses above. There's just a quality to these spaces that begins to get you thinking about different, uh, different things. And then more recently, I went to uh, Ireland um, last September to study thin places because Ireland was one of the places that um, Celtic Christianity was nurtured and started in a sense, and uh, it was kind of known for its thin places. So I went to a number of the places there, and for the most part, they were kind of fossils of thin places. You know, in their previous lives, when they were really used, when a well was really used as a sustaining part of the community, um, it, to me, was really a thin place. I got to experience a little bit of it as a thin place, especially uh, I was visiting them alone and it was very quiet and I could spend a quiet moment just contemplating. And, but other places, um, I went to Skillig Island, which is where the Star Wars movie, the last Star Wars movie was uh, filmed. And um, it had been recommended to me by many people to go there. And it took about an hour to get there by boat. And I went with 12 people and I, uh, we landed at, at Cove Landing, and then you're, you're looking up at these almost sheer stone stone walls. And then there's like 618 stone steps that were laid by monks um, something like 1,500 years ago. And uh, it was really quite extraordinary. None of the steps were the same. They were all very, <laughs> very different. And uh, only in a couple of places were there handrails. Uh, so it was almost mm. no handrails and sheer cliff on one side. So it was really kind of quite scary. And according to Rudolf Otto, in, in his definitions of numinous space, having terror or some form of terror was one of the qualities. So I was really having a numinous uh, moment <laughs> going up to the monastery at, at uh, Skellen. And once I made it up to the top, it was really, really quite nice. And, and all the biophilic patterns and all of the sort of uh, thin place patterns seemed to be functioning there. But again, the monastery was a relic of what it was. It wasn't an actually living monastery. It was, right. um, it was part of the National Trust. But I could begin to imagine, and I actually laid down one of the, there were beehive huts that the monks uh, stayed in. 
and lay down in it and tried to imagine what it would be like sleeping there in a huge snowstorm or a, a rainstorm. And uh, the other thing that was really kind of cool about learning about Skelly was that in the early days of its occupation, from about 600 AD to, I don't know, what, 1300-ish, um, the world was considered flat, right? So, and where is Ireland and where is Skillig Islands on the west coast of Ireland? So it was considered the end of the, of the European world. And it's no wonder Interesting. There, was, there was this monastery there because these people were there because they felt they were at a place where they were the closest to God. Wow. Looking out across to the west, uh, out over the Pacific um, Ocean. And I really got that feeling that uh, they really had this sense that this was you a mean, way. You mean the Atlantic, right? The yeah. Atlantic Ocean? Yeah. yeah. What did I say? Pacific? Pacific, yeah. yeah. Yeah, they it's had, like, wow, now I'm reimagining it all. <laughs> they have really good eyes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the North Atlantic, right. And, um, and then the, there was a, a hermitage site on the very west. There's two peaks uh, in Skelly, Michael. And on the on the western peak was uh, uh, quite high up was a hermitage site. So one for one person. So if you're really needing... To get in contact with God, that's where he went. <laughs> anyway, it was uh, a really a good experience. When I went back, I it was hosted by um, an Irish couple that lived in um, uh, lived nearby, and um, I asked them. I said, "My experience of going to these thin places all over Ireland, I've been good, but I haven't seen leprechauns and fairies and um, all this, you know, magical stuff." And they said, you know, people come to them from abroad and from the States mainly and have the same experience. They, they think they're coming to Ireland to have all these transformative, weird, magical, mystical experiences. And they said, it, it's, you know, Ireland is a, at least the Republic of Ireland is a, uh, has a population of 5 million people and most of them drive cars. And, and I was in a Tesla with these people going around, you know, it's like, right. these are modern people, you know, and uh, living modern lives, having kids and, you know, school and everything else. I mean, it's, um, it's not like they're out there, you know, communing with fairies. Um, right. Know, all day. <laughs> but they said, uh, and I said, well, where do you go for these thin place experiences? And they said, well, we go to, it's a, a beach that's about a couple of miles away called Inch Beach. And it was a beautiful beach, and I stopped there twice to get some photographs. And I, I could begin to understand it because you're in connection with the elements, you know, water and fire with sunsets, and you've got the sand, the earth, and um, you get to play, and you and you can even just you know go on a walk and have a contemplative moment with yourself. So it had all these possibilities, and and here's where people were going. They weren't sort of hiking around the woods looking for fairies. Right. So. Um, I think the point is that, in a way, there are ways for us to redefine these mystical experiences for ourselves. And, and uh, what we have are our own environments. You have your own house, your own neighborhood, uh, places that you visit on vacation and so on. These are the places where you can have these transformative experiences. I know that you've... Um... I know that you've talked about this, touched on this, but in terms of the positive outcomes of approaching, approaching land planning like this, architecture like this, daily living like this, talk about the positive outcomes of thin places and biophilia and thoughtful land use and placemaking. One of the things if I trace my own career and the things that I was interested in, uh, it was an evolving process. And it's like I learned one thing like solar energy. And it wasn't like I left it behind. It's just that I I, I kept it in my container and then moved to uh, renewable resources and then moved to placemaking and then moved to sacred geometry and then moved to village planning and then moved to biophilia and now thin places. And uh, I'm also working with wellness right now. I'm working with the Global uh, Wellness Institute. And um, 
I discovered that all of these different aspects share similar outcomes and similar intentions. And uh, so I found that to be really kind of interesting. And uh, as a part of my research, um, I came up with three kind of categories of positive outcomes. And the first one is is what's called pro-individual. In other words, it's basically more health and wellness aspects of the individual. You know, if I experience a thin place or if I experience biophilia, how is that going to affect me physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, uh, and, and how can it contribute to that? And especially if you're this, this notion of being able to have these experiences more often than, you know, once a year, you know, having them almost on a daily basis. And if you look at uh, the work um, done by Butner on, on Blue Zones, one of the qualities mm-hmm. of these people is that the, the wellness activities are daily activities. Right. Their diet, their exercise, and so on, stuff they do every day. So to me, that's the ultimate goal, which is to bring the positive aspects of all of these things from renewable energy to biophilia to thin places on an everyday basis. So you have these pro-individual um, outcomes. The second is pro-social outcomes. And, and, and what they have, partly what they do, especially all experiences do, is what they call, uh, they contribute to the diminished self. In other words, your infatuation with yourself. <laughs> and uh, that the whole world revolves around yourself. That diminishes, especially when you go to a place like the Grand Canyon. You become small. It's a small self. And that's not a bad thing. But what it does is it gives you perspective. And as a consequence, or and not a consequence, as a, um, a benefit, an outcome of that kind of an experience is the notion of um, sharing, giving, altruism, what they call, um, uh, what are they? Oh, I can't think of the name right now. But um, anyway, you become uh, more generous and more giving. And what this does is create a, a uh, the opportunity for a greater sense of community. So people are attracted to that kind of energy. People are attracted to pro-social energy. So uh, it helps create community and it creates uh, healing at this larger increment beyond the, the individual building, uh, individual uh, person. So um, it promotes friendship, um, gratitude, I think is another one of those uh, qualities. And then the last one is pro-environmental behaviors, which really falls into the biophilia and to some degree the sustainable, uh, which I think is really, uh, really great because one of the biggest things that can come out of this in terms of the pro-environmental behaviors is what my research has found to be um, biospheric values. So uh, people who do not have biospheric values, they care less about whether, you know, a river is polluted or uh, a city has a lot of air pollution or whatever. You know, they're more concerned about themselves. And um, so this pro, uh, this pro biospheric values can lead to positive change, like some of the things you're alluding to, like over-consumerism, I mean, thinking smaller, um, beginning to transition from an automobile-driven lifestyle to a pedestrian-driven lifestyle, these sort of things, uh, because of what they're doing for the environment and for climate change and other things. Um, so uh, those are the, uh, the the three sort of main categories of outcomes uh, from these and a lot of these came to life um, in your work at Serin B, where you were the land planner for this beautiful community. Um, can you talk more about Serin B um, yeah. <laughs> and and the expression of all these beautiful concepts that you've been talking about? How they how many of them are expressed in that setting? Like I said, I accumulated interests over the, the last 40 years, really. And uh, all of a sudden in 2000, 2001, 
I had an opportunity to put them to the ground. And uh, that was a wonderful blessing for me. I was an academic at the time. Um, I was a department head at Texas A&M University and um, wasn't really looking for work. But the Cerebi project came along and it just seemed too good to pass up. And it seemed to be a way of putting down a lot of these ideas that were still floating around. It's just ideas. And I had with them, which is what I had with you <laughs> um, on, on Bell Farms, a really receptive and biospheric value thinking client. So um, you have to have that to begin with, because if it's, if they're only thinking about the economics, you're never going to realize these things. So uh, they were biospheric and they wanted, you know, all the qualities that I had been studying and they, they were aware of up until around the year 2000. You have to re realize year 2000 was a kind of a, a weird year. Um, Al Gore came out with his movie, you know, on climate change. Mm -hmm. um, most of the political leaders at the time did not believe that climate change was real. Um, and in general, I think this is a generalization, but I don't think the American public was overly biospheric in their thinking. And so it was a tough time to bring a lot of these ideas to the ground. But like I said, um, I had a, um, a client that was and Steve and Marie Nigren that were uh, really uh, wanting this kind of uh, development. And they owned the land, which meant that that was a big component of the process of the uh, economics of bringing the project forward. And they went into partnership where they, with, with, um, with, with uh, money in a sense, and that money allowed them to begin the infrastructure project part of the process. But what was really interesting, I think, about uh, Serenby as I look at it over the last 20 years is that it's been an evolving process. And as our thinking has evolved, so has Serenby. And the things that seem to work inform what we do next. And we really right. did design it and build it in very in a very incremental way. We didn't just say, well, here's the land plan. Let's just build everything. And we're still building. We're about halfway there now after 20 years, and uh, maybe a third of the way, depending on how big it's ultimately going to get. So we were able to learn um, from this slower growth process. And we employed a lot of the planning ideas that I had learned on, my, on village planning, um, mixes of use, growth by multiplication rather than addition. So rather than just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, it gets to an ideal size and then you replicate it. And so we have a whole series of about five hamlets that make up what I call constellating urbanism. And each one is themed, which is really kind of cool. Each hamlet has... And, and, theme, and themed in a beautiful way, not a cheesy way, right? It's not yeah. like... A, <laughs> it's just really stunning. Yeah, it's... Uh, my first reaction was, oh, this could become kind of weird and strange. And... Um, not really help promote this place, you know, like a Disneyland. Um, right. So, but the themes became kind of integral to the philosophy of the place. So the first Hamlet was themed the arts because they felt that creativity and beauty and the arts was the first component that needed to be built. So the non-residential activities, the, the houses and everything else had to be beautiful and of the arts and, and convey this kind of notion of creativity. And what happened was it attracted people who were creative. Duh. You know, it's like, oh, okay. Uh, that's exactly what we wanted. And they began to be part of what helped it grow into the next phase. And the next Hamlet uh, called Grange was based on the 25 acre organic farm. So it was much, a much more grounded uh, Hamlet. We have the arts on one hand, and then you have agriculture on the other hand, and there was a stables uh, as well. And so that seemed to really play out really well. And then the third hamlet is called Motto, and it's oriented towards health and wellness. And it's the densest, and it has the greatest amount of non-residential uses in there. And it's probably two-thirds of the way built now. Um, and it's really, uh, really wonderful with the kinds of non-residential activities 
Uh, it's got its own sort of restaurant, fitness center, Pilates, uh, K through 12 elementary schools, community swimming pool, uh, a veterinary, uh, dentists, doctors, uh, chiropractors, um, all kinds of wellness studios and spas and that kind of stuff, all the wellness kinds of things. And the other thing is it's not all in one building. It's all distributed throughout the community, which is really kind of cool. So it's a hamlet with wellness as the kind of um, infrastructure uh, of the right. place in a sense. And uh, the next one is called Spella, and it's some of the initial um, – Work has been done on it now, and it, it'll probably move ahead in the next year or so. And it's oriented towards play. And at its center is a 400-foot by 400-foot park. And to function much like Central Park does to Manhattan, but on, obviously on a much smaller scale. It doesn't quite have the non-residential mix that uh, Motto has, but it uh, really has this park as this major feature. And uh, I think it's going to be just absolutely wonderful. And then uh, the next one after that is uh, we're in the planning phases on it right now. We don't have a name for it, but it's uh, the education hamlet. It's going to be oriented towards education. And then uh, the next one after that, which is the one I've been working on most recently and the one I'm most excited about is, again, it doesn't have a, a name, but it is essentially a middle housing development that's uh, oriented towards uh, worker housing and affordability. And so uh, I can't wait to really get into the teeth of this one. I've got the overall master plan for it, but I can't wait to get into the details of it because I think it's going to really round out uh, Serenity um, in, in terms of uh, the breadth of what it can express. The other thing about Serenity I think is really interesting for me over the last 20, it's been 22 years that I've worked on it, is that I've decided to do less consulting, like on projects like yours, uh, only a few, uh, but really spend most of my time on one project where I live, because okay. there I can really learn and contribute on a day-to-day -day basis, um, everything that's going on. I've had my hand in everything, that, uh, every design problem here. Um, uh, the architecture, I don't do any of the architecture, even though I'm an architect, but I'm involved in consulting with the owner um, on uh, on the architecture. So it's been really exciting to be a part of that process. Well, and um, I, I guess I feel grateful, <laughs> very grateful that I snuck in. <laughs> I snuck in because you've, you've um, you know, I, I've mentioned this before to you, but you have been such a mentor to, you know, to me, such an, I, I didn't even know I was looking for you <laughs> in the world. Like I didn't know I needed you until I met you. And um, just you've shifted so many of the ways I, I see the world and I look at things. And um, so I totally understand the desire for you to hold up with this beautiful project that is sort of like the culmination of all your other work. And there's so much wonderful work yet to be done there at Serenby. So um, I, I totally get that, but I do feel very fortunate um, of the timing of when I met you, that I got to work with you, that I got to, you know, that you were a mentor to me. And um, even when we're not in daily communication with each other, um, you're, you, you influence me so much. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful to you and, um, and to Serenby really for um, showing me that there's a different way well, um, we're to grateful. do things. We're grateful with you because um, it's rare that you have, that we have such open, call your client, open clients that we work with. And uh, we're, highly discriminating in terms of the people that we do <laughs> consult because we want people who are going to be dedicated to really dedicated to bringing some of these ideas forward and in the face of a lot of difficulty it was not easy for ceremony to get to where it is today and hundreds and hundreds of battles had to be won in order to get here and uh, very often developers will come here and they'll like what they see at Serenby and then they go back home 
and they cave in to all the economic and political pressures. And you haven't done that. I mean, you've responded to them. You had to. <laughs> but uh, for me, it's uh, what really made Serenby happen. I, I talk about this. Three things. There were three ingredients to begin with. One was the land. Two was Stephen Marie's enthusiasm about the project. And three was the design. So you have this kind of uh, forward-thinking design. You have there the enthusiasm of the Nigrans and the beauty of this property. And uh, you have to have what I what I learned in sacred geometry is the golden thread. So we started in 2001 with a set of about nine environmental goals uh, for this project. And we've never let off any of those goals throughout the 22 years. So uh, you need that kind of dedication, I think, uh, into a project like this in order to overcome the obstacles that you're going to be facing. And if you start to cave in, and then you're going to cave in, and you're going to cave in more, and you're going to cave in more, then pretty soon, before you know it, you have a conventional uh, development. So, not you. What, um, as we kind of come to a close here, what one book, outside of your own brilliant books, which, by the way, I'm going to, um, when we when we post this um, within the show notes, we'll have some imagery and we'll also have a list of, of Phil's books and um, how you can reach him. But, but Phil, like in, when you look back over, I mean, I'm looking behind you, you're sitting, you're sitting in your office and behind you is your library. <laughs> I, I love this visual for this question, actually. I mean, what, what one book would you recommend to our listeners? Well, that's hard because there's a series of probably a half a dozen to a dozen books that are germane to the kind of topics that we talked about today, from sustainability to biophilia and thin places and so on, uh, and, and village planning. But I think the one book that's influenced me the most is the I Ching, because it's always reminding me that there's a battle between my higher and my lower self. And uh, the hexagrams, there's 64 hexagrams, are gems of wisdom about how to deal with a particular situation relative to that battle of being, of going with your higher self or the lower self. And I think we all kind of go through that kind of process in a sense. And, um, that's been really helpful throughout the years. I mean, I've been reading that book since the mid 1970s, and uh, I don't necessarily read it every day, but I do consult it every once in a while. And there's just some absolute gems um, in there. For example, um, if you want to know about the nature of a place, and I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, um, look to see what aspects of that place are most nurtured. Mm. And in the I Ching, it's more about yourself. So what aspect of your personality are you nurturing is going to give you the greatest insight as to who you are. So uh, little gems like that when I'm going along, you know, designing stuff <laughs> or dealing with clients or whatever have been really helpful. Thank you for You're being welcome. on the show today. Yes. Thank you so much for your time listening to or watching this interview with Dr. Phil Tab. I'll leave you now with a quote from the great Maya Angelou. When we know better, we do better. Thanks, everyone. This is the Kathleen Sessions podcast. <laughs>